last of our series for our Wednesdays in winter. Um, Chaplain Ron Buck will present Muscatball to Miniball. He will explore briefly manufacturing methods, cartridge, and bullet types of small arms ammunition in the Northern and Southern armies during the Civil War. Many authentic examples, as you can see here, and most of you have already been up here, you can see um, these wonderful examples that he has to show us. Chaplain Buck Bupp received a BA from Crossroads Bible College and a Master's of Theology degree from Crossroads Graduate School of Divinity and completed and earned a doctorate and master in ministry from Trinity Theological Seminary. Ron is a Civil War enthusiast with interest in the Battle of Gettysburg. He has given lectures at historical societies and colleges, high schools, civic groups, on the strategy, equipment, and ordnance used at Gettysburg and other related Civil War subjects. Ron served for four years in the United States Marine Corps with um, time spent in Vietnam. Uh, Ron is married with two daughters, Kristen and Sherry. It is my pleasure to introduce Chaplain Buck. Let's give Chaplain Buck a nice warm welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking your afternoon off. As was mentioned, I'm the chaplain at the York County Prison. I am not in a hurry to get back. <laughs> and I've noticed that every clock in here has different times. <laughs> so, okay, I'm sorry, I digress. Someone brought up the question already, and I, and I know I'm going to trip over this, but it's okay. Someone brought up the question already, Ron. You got a mini, is mini spelled right up there? Yes. It is spelled two ways, M-I-N-N-I-E and 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 M-I-N-I-E. I see that in both official uh, productions of uh, paper, reaper, uh, in books, and even during periods. So they spell it both ways. It got its uh, name from uh, Captain M Minet, Claude Minet in 1846 in the French Army when he, by the way, I'm going to send around some items, authentic items, and since I'm a prison chaplain, I kind of understand that what is I'm going to send out, I'm expecting to come back. One, two, three, four, five. There's five of these in there. So these are the what we would call the culottes, or the little iron bases that is in the back of Captain Benet's original conical bullet that when the bullet was fired, this little cup would push up inside of it, push the sides of the bullet out into the rifling, and off it would go. Eventually, these things proved to be not so good because they tend to blow right straight through the bullet, and then you have a problem. The cup goes out, the bullet stays in the barrel. Big problem. So we'll pass that around. I have some other things I'll be passing around. Uh, I got started, oh, by the way, if you have a question, I've been collecting small, civil war small arms ammunition for over 20 years, 20, 25 years. Sometimes I will say things and I'm not explaining myself very well because I'm so used to using the terminology or hearing it. And if you look at me like a deer in the headlights, would you just say, Ron, uh, what's that? And I'll, and I'll stop and I'll explain it. And if you have any questions along the way, please raise your hand. Let me answer the question. All right, I got started collecting. Many of you familiar with the layout of Gettysburg, oh, 50 years ago? I know some of you know. Some of you, yes. Years ago, I asked 50 years ago. 50 years ago was the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. I was 13 years old. And I said, Dad, and it was kind of in the middle of the centennial. And there's Gettysburg. You don't have to travel all the way down to these different places in Virginia. Gettysburg's right next door. Dad, would you please take me to Gettysburg? I want to go up. So Dad took me up. Bless his son. And we saw the parade. I remember standing in the circle as the parade came by. I remember seeing that parade. I think it was heading south. And uh, we walked in town a little bit. And we stopped by a little shop. His name was George Lauer. Anybody hear that name before? George Lauer was a, a barber. Barber slash relic hunter. No, relic seller, I should say, but he didn't hunt. And in his window, he had artifacts and things, and I said, Dad, 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 Dad. 
Mm -mm. So we went in, and I bought, no, I didn't. Dad bought me a little Confederate bullet. That did it. And then the rest started adding in. Hope I can remember to keep changing this thing. Why? There's only four bullets in that glass bottle. Good, because that's how many it started with. You said five. five. It was a test, I think. <laughs> Just so you know. And is that, is that your personal collection, or is that yes. the museum? No, oh, that's mine. Like, wow, I thought that was a museum. Thank you. That's a lot for 20 years. You said you've been collecting. Well, some of it I, I purchased, some of it I have found. I know what you do, Ernie. <laughs> Mil munitions. Muni wow. Munitions are purchased from, and, and some of this can be a little bit, I think this is my, nope, that's not my dot thing. That's my dot thing. Um, there's one place that is questionable. It's very clear that the U.S. bought musician, munitions from these areas, and weapons too. This was very questionable until about five years ago. There's a round which you'll be seeing, a picture, and I know I don't have one with me today, but there was one round that is known as the Carcano. Italian Carcano. It's not, but we're going to find out what that is. U.S. and C.S. arsenals were required to produce ammunition for pistols, carbines, rifles, musketoons, repeaters, musket rifles, and plain muskets. Now, I stand corrected here. This is not 30, just 35, it's 22 caliber. Um, Smith & Wesson came out with a 22 caliber at or before that time, and they show up on battlefields all the way up to 75 caliber round ball. That's a, that's a half an inch, a quarter of a, three quarters of an inch before it, it impacts. It's soft lead. What is that going to do? Both governments and private contractors produced several billion cartridges. These are just some of the arsenals in the north and in the south, a little bit more in the south as they were with what? States' rights. The states' rights philosophy had to carry with it, Georgia produces ammunition for Georgia. Good idea. But how do you get it to Georgia troops who are in Pennsylvania or northern Virginia? And there's, there was a supply problem. They worked some of it out, and you're going to see examples of some of these. And then the federal, the federal side of the house. Some of these uh, were lost and then regained. Harper's Ferry was temporarily lost and then regained. And some of these down through here, uh, particularly Little Rock and uh, Charleston eventually fell. Some of them then would, uh, oh, Texas too. They produced all the way to the end of the war. Cartridges were made from paper, cardboard, and I have these as examples here. Silk, rubber, copper, skin, linen, tin, brass foil, iron, or none. I'm glad I don't have the notes up here because now I can challenge some of you hunters that I have here. None meaning the Hunt and Jennings. The Hunt and Jennings is a pre-Civil War bullet cartridge that the cartridge, yep, we got some right in there. They had the powder inside of the bullet. It was known as a rocket bullet. Well, the volcanic morphed to, uh, to the Hunt and Jennings. The Hunt and Jennings then developed into what? Okay, Henry. Henry. The Henry. We got those in here. The Henry revol uh, developed into what? Winchester. Who we have today. Uh, the Hunt and Jennings and the Henry rifles look a lot like the Winchesters. You can track the family line back through. Uh, let's see, I'm getting more notes here. All right, let's move on. These are, we're, someone asked me about the buck and ball. We're going to be getting to the buck and ball in just a moment. Even as late as Gettysburg, in mid 1863, federal regiments, and, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to be mentioning is relating to Gettysburg. It's true throughout the entire war, but a lot of this, you'll see, it's focused there. They were, some of them were still carrying 69 caliber smooth bores. And then I have a list. I know it's really hard to see, but that is a list of, Pence, uh, of federal troops carrying smoothbore muskets as late as 1863 to Gettysburg and beyond during Gettysburg campaign. Now, get, the, get wrap your mind around this. 
Union soldiers, it is estimated, carried 4.3 million rounds of small arms ammunition to the battlefield in addition to the supply wagons in, in reserve, holding an additional five and a half, six and a half million additional cartridges of all calibers in service. That's a lot of bullets. We're going to see some of the confusion that will be coming along with that. <clears throat> Here's, oh my, that's short and squatty. You know, each one of the presentations, it's different. It, it, it doesn't look like a barrel, the cartridge. It's really about only that long. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, <laughs> 11. <laughs> uh, inside of here, you will find, you will find a buck and ball cartridge. And that is what Union, we'll start it here and get it around. And that is what the, um, Union and Confederate started with. You will have the three, you can see over here, musket ball. It's supposed to be round, not the shape of a football. And round with 331 caliber buckshot. This is one that was found in the ground. It was in the ground so long that the paper disintegrated and the bullet, the lead buckshot fused to the round ball. But this is what it would look like before it would have went into the ground. The ground ball is in here, three buckshot are up there. You can, and part of what I want to do here, this is just a primer. What I want to do here is, many of you folks will probably be going to Gettysburg, Antietam, and different Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, different battlefields, and you'll go through some of the, the relic shops. Sometimes, part of what I'm trying to do here is to educate you of what might be laying in that, in that uh, uh, bin in front of you that might have some significant value. Just this past week, I was at Fredericksburg, I digress here just a bit, I was at Fredericksburg show, there was a relic show down there. I was at a, a table like this, I'm walking by the table like this, and he's got a little box, and he's got just a bunch of mini balls and stuff in it, and I, I saw three carbine bullets in there. I said, uh, these yours? Yeah. I said, uh, what do you have to have for those three? They were Linder carbine bullets, and that means nothing to you, I'll show a picture of them. They were Linder, take my word for it, Linder carbine bullets. These bullets are 35 to $40 each. I said, uh, how much you have to have for them? He says, uh, give, me, give me two bucks each. Okay. <laughs> See, the thing is, you have to know what's in front of you. I have found many of my bullets that I have in here. I found in bins that the seller had no clue what they were. And they were good bullets. They were rare. Far more valuable. All right. I, again, I died for this. Oh, I might add about the uh, buck and ball. Uh, the buck and ball cartridges stayed in the Union Army as late. Uh, I'm sorry. The federal arsenals, one in particular, generated and produced buck and ball cartridges for the Union as late as December 1864. So there are a lot of these fired at Gettysburg by both sides. And uh, here is a picture at Gettysburg, and you can clearly see the buck and ball up on the top, and it says buck and ball, caliber 69, 12 New Jersey Regiment. Anybody know where that's at? That is on Cemetery Ridge. If, uh, let's see if I can get my directions right here. Yeah, uh, no, not exactly. If you are looking at Gettysburg in a map, and the fish hook goes up here, this is right at the, almost north of the angle is where they are. Pickett's charge is taking place right down in this area. They were part of it. Matter of fact, they were the ones, these poor guys, were those who were responsible for going out to the Bliss Barn and capturing the Bliss Barn. They capture the Bliss Barn and get direct, and then get orders to pull out. So what do you think happened? The Confederates come back in again. So they get orders. Take the bliss barn, out they go. They get more casualties, they take the bliss barn. This time they burn it. But uh, this is the port 12th, New Jersey. Uh, here's another one. This is the old parking lot to the electric map. So you're looking north. We've literally come up Hancock Avenue and we've now made a right going into the, uh, the parking lot where the, uh, that wasn't electric map, that was the, where the uh, psychorama was. And you can see it on there, too. Buck and ball, caliber 69, but someone stole. <laughs> someone said, where you laughing? I'm keeping count on you, too. Where's my stuff at? You got them. How many's in there? Ten. There's ten. 
<laughs> okay, let's move on. In Lee's Army General Ewell's Corps, during his trek through, the Shenandoah Valley captured about 200,000 rounds of small arms. And of course, we know, many of us know about uh, General uh, Milroy abandoning Winchester and all the horses, the fodder, the wagons, the artillery, ammunition, small arms travel along with him. And they seem to be dispensed throughout the uh, Northern Army of Virginia, particularly in Ewell's Corps. And where General Early is, you find a lot of dropped in their camps, dropped Union bullets. I wonder where they came from. Thank you, General Miller. So there were Yankee bullets being fired right back at Yankees on the first day, generally. Uh, General Gordon up on Barley's Knoll and through there. Records indicate Lee's army had 4.1 million cartridges available. Both armies together carried about 9.5 million rounds of small arms in the Battle of Gettysburg or the Gettysburg Campaign. That's a lot of lead. That's just ammunition. That's not counting um, artillery, and it's not counting all the other things that would be in support of this. That's incredible, 9.5 million rounds. This was a, was a handout that I got in a box of souvenir bullets back in the 60s. It says, uh, let me find my note here so that I don't get you all. Oh, yes. First, there is several myths. The one note up here says, in order to secure the lead necessary to make these bullets, many of the soldiers melted and used the lead from their lead belt plates. Close quote. That assumes they had the correct bullet mold and loose powder and paper to produce a cartridge. Southern troops rarely used lead in buckles. Uh, if they have a U.S. buckle, and there's, you might get two bullets out of it, but then you don't have a buckle. Uh, your, your cap box is not, you'll be falling down, the bayonet scabbard and bayonet will have nothing to hang on to, and your cartridge box is supposed to be held in by, what are you going to do? Come on, you're not going to use, use that. So this is one of those myths uh, that, no, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that uh, soldiers did not cast bullets. They did. They cast some uh, pistol bullets, lots of pistol bullets. Many pistols that were, were purchased would have a bullet mold with it and a flask. You've probably seen the display cases. So they could, they could mold some of their own bullets. But by far and away, the millions and billions of bullets that were produced weren't produced by guys sitting around the campfire uh, putting a lead into a mold. Not even close. This is generally how it happened. Uh, this is a photo of a machine that will be able to produce, you see a bullet coming down through, it's pating, 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 pating. They can produce about 30,000 bullets in a 10 hour shift. So they're producing a lot of bullets. We'll see that a little bit more as we move along. Uh, here's another one. There will be a lead slug, and I don't, didn't bring one along, but there's just basically a rod, a lead rod. You'll see a picture of it. Lead rod, it will be cut off at certain points, leaving the slug. The slug will get inserted here. This will make the, the grooves. This will eventually push the finished product out, and the slug is then compressed, as you can see here, into this mold. And uh, when that comes back, the front will be pushed out, and it just repeats, 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 repeats. <clears throat> this is another one, and it's actually showing how it is being produced. There's the slug. It is introduced in this area here, and this one is, as, I don't know if you can read it down here, yes, it says, this was a machine that was patented by J.D. Custer, no relation that I'm aware of, in Norristown, Pennsylvania. It was a press turn. It would press the Shape, uh-oh, it's the wrong <laughs> button. There we go, wrong button. It will press the slug into this shape, and then it goes to another move, mode where it will then turn the whole bullet and cut rings into it. These are distinct bullets. You'll be seeing them, and I have, no, I don't have any with me today. They have uh, marks in the base where, where it would bite into the lead to turn. Uh, yes? Is that process still considered casting? No. Okay. 
No. Good point. We're going to get to that. Excellent point. <clears throat> it's hard to read, but up at the top, this was just recently from Civil War Mon the Civil War Monitor, Volume 4, page 18 where they give you an idea how many of these bullets were produced in the North, and that's only 58 caliber. 470 million 58 caliber bullets were produced in the North, not counting the South, not counting any other caliber, just 58 caliber. Now, we'll get to some of the uh, base markets. Now, when you go to that relic shop or you go to that place where they got the bin of bullets, look, <laughs> look. Now, the star base, not relatively rare, not too rare. It's associated now, when I say base, if you look at that bullet and it has a cavity, when the machine was punching those things out, that was a die mark, and it would give the idea of the die wearing. Once that star becomes a little foggy, then it's time to replace the die. And they would keep an eye on that. So the, the Crisp Star Base is uh, associated with the Washington Arsenal. The U.S. Base, look for the U.S. in the base. That's a $65 bullet right there. That, and I found some, and they don't know that they were there. The, them, the, the Star Base is not so much very common. I found quite a few of those. Mm -hmm. I found several of the U.S.'s, but uh, uh, the U.S. is associated with the Washington Ars uh, Springfield Arsenal. That's the Washington Arsenal, that's supposed to be the Springfield Arsenal. And these then are the marks that would be left in them, that Custer machine that would turn it. Now here you can look into the base. I'm gonna leave my notes eventually on, on the next one. Up here you can see into the base, these are Enfields. These are from, up here at the top, they are from, actually these three, are from England. Lots of stuff came in from England for the South. Here you can see a star in the base, very foggy, but there's a U.S. there. And here you can see where the, the, the Custer machine turned the bullets. This one's a star base, not a star, I'm sorry, triangle base. That came from France. We have French, we have English, we have possibly some that came across the Mexican border for southern Texas. Very possible. I have an example at home that, that is found in a Confederate camp, may have come from across the border. Yes, sir. Um, is the custom machine base as viable as the U.S. base, or? No, good question, they're not. Uh, these are rather, rather common. This is a nice bullet to find. You're not gonna probably find one of those in the box, though. You will find those. Mm, not so much the Enfields, but you might find some. And when I say Enfield, Enfield is English. And it's a smooth bullet as opposed to, no, I'm gonna get ahead of myself, because I'm gonna, ask you questions, and this is all going to be on the test at the end anyway. <laughs> all right, now we got some of the bullet markings. In the end fields from England, the P that you see there is from the William Parcel. The S, which is the bottom left there, is very rare. It is from the Schishinger and Wells Ammunition Works in Kent. My uh, old, youngest daughter is married to Kent, so I guess there's a linkage there. The L is from E and A Ludlow, Birmingham. Numbers one through eight are from Woolrich Arsenal. And numbers 55 and 57 were manufactured at Ely Brothers, London. The wheel, the, the dot, and the some call this just spokes or the rimless wheel. Uh, we don't know where they came from. We know they're from England, but we don't know who made them. I called, and you see at the bottom here, uh, Jim and Dean Thomas, they're the ones who produced this book and volumes of books on Civil War ammunition. I, I emailed him, I said, where did they, I don't know. But I do know that this raised dot and P base Enfields are coming off of, or had come off of the blockade runner, Modern Greece, that was sunk off of Fort Fisher, North Carolina, close to Wilmington. They came off the same blockade runner, so there might have been a connection there. All right, moving on. Here's some end fields. This one, in fact, getting close to your question regarding casting. This, this one was cast in the nose and they're Confederate manufacturer. This one, you can see a little sprue mark here. It's cast toward the bottom. And this one, another cut off sprue mark at the side. There are problems with cast bullets. Lots of problems with cast bullets. 
The English cartridges look like this. The bullet in the US, the bullet faces up. In the British brand manufacturing, the bullet is facing this way. So what they'll do is they'll take and rip off the tail, they load the powder, and they, this is lubricant on each end outside of the paper. So the paper at that point gets loaded with the powder and that will act as a lubricant as it's fired. I find this picture fascinating. I love this picture. There's so much going on here. This is a typical workshop, not necessarily in an arsenal, probably at some private concern that is contracted. You can see, over here are the lead rods, and here are the machines that are making the bullets. And here are seven boxes full of finished bullets. Notice the ones laying on the floor. A couple of them laying around there. So that's probably the better part of a day's work. There's, one, there's supposed to be a thousand rounds in each box when it's made. But these aren't made, they're loose, so there's probably more than a thousand in each one of those boxes. Again, one day's production. Downside of this, when they were making them, when they wrap the cartridges, they're usually using children. Because children have more flexibility with their fingers than tie those little strings. And unfortunately, there were many, many, many horrific accidents. They're handling powder and percussion caps and friction primers. What could go wrong with children who don't understand the dangers of those things? Many of them would die making cartridges. Uh, there are several uh, articles printed at the time of explosions and uh, children and others around are totally consumed by the explosions. It was very dangerous. Another thing that I find interesting about this is these, these artillery shells, these round balls here. This one you can see from maybe not from where you are is being, the fuse is being reamed out for a Borman fuse. And there's a couple of big ones up here getting ready to be machined too. Great picture, a lot of activity. There's even a, a remains of an artillery carriage sitting here. There's the wheels and the cross member there. What is that doing there? I don't know. It had to be in the way if nothing else. Any questions as we move on? Move on quickly. Yes, sir? Um, did those big cannonballs inspire bowling balls? That's me. Yeah. Sorry. No. <laughs> Methinks me thinks cannonballs came before bowling balls. And besides that, you're, you're a one thumber? That <laughs> Uh, these are machine-made Yankee bullets. They're 54 caliber. What's interesting about these is this is the type of bullet that was used in the Austrian rifles. The Austrian rifles were used by both sides, but interestingly enough, at Gettysburg, on the first day, under General Reynolds, when the Iron Brigade goes into that woods, many men of the Iron Brigade were carrying 54 Austrians, and they were firing those, those type of bullets. This is how the cartridge was made. There's paper and paper and wrapping and then paper. See, this is where, where the uh, children were involved. The youngsters were involved by taking this piece of paper and you would roll it around the mandrel. The bullet would be inserted. This is a separate powder uh, roll that is made separately and then is put to, with the bullet, wrapped in the paper, and that is your finished product. There's 10 of them in... Oh! I gotta stay away from the uh, laser. That's what's doing this to me. All right, no more laser. Ten of them are inside of the pack. The pack would be in a bundle. The bundle would be marked arsenal, date, where it was when it was manufactured, and what the weapon what is for. That is how we know where some of these bullets are coming from. That's how we can identify some of them. So here's this inner slide, inner paper, outer wrapper. All this work goes together for one cartridge. And uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that up until close to World War II, some of you historians tweak me a little bit of this, good teeth were part of a prerequisite for enlistment. They didn't drop it until then because you needed good teeth to tear the cartridge. Number two is that you use the tail of the cartridge to pull it out of the cartridge box and then tear the cartridge off, and then empty the powder into the rifle or musket. Then, 
rules say, army's army. All the paper has to be removed from the bullet. Then the bullet goes on. Then you ram it down. While you're being shot at. <clears throat> but you see, that's what they're doing too on the other side. You get three rounds off a minute. They're getting three rounds off a minute too. Hopefully they're missing. I, I want to just stop for just a minute. Um, I, I forgot to say something at the introduction. Do we have any veterans here? Raise your hand if you're a veteran. Got two? Thank you for your service. Thank you. These are, then here's your arsenal produced or privately produced cartridge. But we had some ideas, inventors. The war is a wonderful time for invention. So this one here, the Johnson and Dow cartridge, is a paper cartridge that is permeated with a, a nitrate of some sort that it can be loaded just like that whole cartridge goes. This one, same, compressed powder, but it doesn't have that envelope. It has a, like a shellac on the outside of it. There's the weak spot. These cartridges tended to break. Uh, and they would use some silk, and I mentioned silk. They use silk here to adhere the, the two joints so that it stays together. The Chadwick uh, is kind of a compromise between, you don't have to tie the end of it, you don't need all that extra paper up there, and frankly, you don't have to get rid of all the paper. You just tear it, and you run it down, and you go. So from that point to these two most efficient ones, that probably increased the rate of fire to maybe four or five rounds a minute, not having to remove that paper. And the cost, of production, you don't need all that much paper, you don't need the strain, saves time. Strange, the government saving money? <laughs> oh, there's that bucket ball thing there. It looks like an artillery shell in here, don't it? All right, standards, these are the 69 calibers. Oh, that box that's floating around has uh, two 69 caliber musket balls in it. 69 caliber, leaving the barrel. It will mushroom to be quite large. Let me catch up on some of my notes here so that I don't forget something. Now, let's go to our next thought. How were the majority of bullets produced in the Confederacy? Belt buckles, as stated before. Well, Confederates rarely ever use lead and belt buckles. You can't afford to do that. So, what did they do? They used thousands of gang molds. They're molding them. By the thousands they're molding now. And this is an example. There's the mold. There's the production. You can see that at the top, they would have to cut the sprue off. And then it would be loaded as with other uh, paper cartridges. Another myth is this 58 caliber, which it's referring to, push the right button, this one here, and then this one here, which is not real good drawing reproductions. Myth four, this 58 caliber Confederate bullet can be identified by two, count them, two grease grooves or rings at the base of the bullet. Union bullet, it says, has three. Okay, let's put that to the test. Which one is Confederate? Which one is Union? They're all Confederate. And they all have three rings. Well, that myth is busted. How do we know that these are Confederate? Well, the way they're made, they're mostly cast, and you can tell a cast bullet as opposed to a machine bullet. We know this one came from Texas because they uh, still exist in some original packages. We know that. And some of these, as they are of this one, Georgia troops, we find them in Georgia camps all the time. They have a little teeth in the bottom, and it's a very distinctive bullet. So they cast them. Here are some more. We know that that one on the end is from the Charleston Arsenal, Confederate Charleston Arsenal production. We don't exactly know where this was produced, but we know it's Confederate because of its crudity and how it was made. Now these, this is believed to be the Italian Cartano bullet. No, they did found out, that is Dean Thomas and his brother Jim, found out through research and checking on patented these are patented bullets, that they were made at the Institute of the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's where they came from. <laughs> it is all documented. These are modeled, these are modeled after a European Austrian bullet, but they are ours. They're solid base, and what happens is when this is fired, this little cone collapses up into this little cone, which collapses up into that cone and gets into the right place. 
This is the, it didn't show up too well, but here you can see how the cartridges were wrapped in 10 and how they're identified. 10 cartridges, 57 or 58 caliber, Enfield rifle, conical ball, Richmond, Arsenal, 1863. That, that's what came out of it, so we know what they look like. I'm going to pass this around. This is a, is, you will see that is it. This is between a six and a thousand dollar cartridge, if it were real. It's not, it's a reproduction, but you can see what it would look like. This is why, this is where the myth came from. These are the most common bullets that will show up in battlefields on the northeast. Because the Richmond Arsenal was right there, and I think the Richmond Arsenal produced uh, 72 million of these cartridges in 69, 58, and 54 caliber. So the common Confederate bullet to be found was two rings. So the conclusion is two rings, Confederate, right? No. Just for that, because that is a patented Gardner. No, G A R D N E R. Gardner. We've got something else coming up that's going to be very close to it. This is how it's produced it is cast. The sprue is then nipped off. It has this lead ring around it, and this is a hollow cone in here. It goes to the next step where a, a, a cylinder of paper is put up on this base, and it is driven through a die that crimps it down onto the paper, then powder is added and it's folded shut, and on it moves. Ten of them in a pack. There's a problem, though, with casting bullets. That's what happens with casting bullets. There are a lot of intrusions in the lead when they cast the bullet, and these little air pockets blow out. And what happens, the whole front of the bullet opens up, and the bullet either goes out and just goes wherever it wants to go, or it stays in the barrel. Now what do you do? Stuck in the barrel. That's a problem with cast bullets. I have a lot of cast bullets um, at home that look like this. I found several. Uh, large calibers, small calibers, move on quick. There's the Gardner at the 54 caliber, and then they decided to stop doing this with these bullets in Richmond and change it over to the Linger and White. That is from a machine. They moved over to a machine. Most of the other arsenals are still forced to use uh, the molds. Selma, as you can see, these are examples are from Selma. Back to the buck and ball. The buck and ball, just back up and make a statement here. The buck and ball is great in breaking up an infantry attack, isn't it? Buck shot, buck and ball. You got one round ball and three buck shot, you got four potential impact points. So the union figures, well, let's, let's make something that we can use along that line for our rifled muskets. They go to the shaler. The shaler comes then as an equivalent for the rifle. This is smoothbore. That would be for the rifle. And in theory, what happens is you shoot this thing and it separates. You laugh. It don't separate. <laughs> lead mashes into lead. And uh, you'll find them shot. But most of them that have been found were dropped and thrown away. They just didn't work. There was a, another problem with them. Uh, part of it is if you don't fire it and you need to get the worm out and worm the bullet out, you will get maybe the first section and the second section. And I have an example here, I think I did, uh, of uh, a soldier who had to try to get the bullet out for whatever reason. Powder's way. It just misfires. Problem. He got to get the bullet out. The first two sections, if you get that worm screw down through the bullet to pull the two front out, the bottom one's still there. <coughs> and you can't do that to get it out. Uh, the problem is it really disables the weapon. Uh, by the way, when this was um, loaded, it would have to be loaded with the paper to keep the sections all together. Uh, this, I have this example here. I'm pretty sure I do. Uh, there are, yes I do. This one is four. Note about this. These came out only out of the camp in Falmouth, as you can see. I have one here, and uh, the problem is, is that areas where a lot of these artifacts are being recovered are being lost to buildings. You can't do this, go there anymore, that's all built up. Now we go to the Gardiner, G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R, -E Yankee, explosive bullets. 
Yeah, they did. They had explosive bullets. They had 54 and 58 caliber explosive bullets. Examples are here. I happened to find one of these uh, down southern end of town. An attorney invited me over to her house. She lived on a stone house where the 6th Pennsylvania uh, Russia's Lancers monument is. It was a cavalry attack just after Pickett's charge down there. The Union attacked the Confederate right flank. And uh, I found one in her yard, right in her yard. It was wonderful. First and only one I've ever found. Here is an example of it cut in half. There's a copper cylinder inside with powder. And the thing of it is, is here's the fuse hole that goes up into it. The powder would burn about a second and a quarter and then burst. It was not designed to shoot at people. It was designed to shoot at caissons. Woof. Blow up the caissons. That's what they were supposed to be used for, but I'm sure they were used for everything else. <laughs> but they were not light. They were used only in two major battles, and that would be Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, and now outside of it, they, they tend to disappear. Uh, Did they work well? Um, I, I haven't had too much reading on how well they worked in terms of taking out caissons. They worked really well in failure. They, they would uh, somehow, if an artillery shell burst close and there was enough flame and you had your cartridge box open and they start to burn, you, you explode. Uh, there were several incidents where Confederates are hearing this snap, snap, snap. There must be these guys exploding in the air, but I don't think any rebels fell down as a result of it. Uh, here's the 52 caliber. I said 54, bad, bad, bad. 54 caliber, extremely rare. And on the base of it, I have one down here. It came from Gettysburg. You can see the patent information on the base. And one of them down here, you can see the patent information on the base. Moving, moving, moving. OK. So Yankees had some explosive bullets. Confederates tried to do that too, even less of a success. 69 caliber, one of these is down here. It's a lead ball with a nail that comes down close to the bottom. There's percussion compound at the bottom, and this is filled with powder. Now you're gonna load that. Not a good idea. Well, okay, let's try something else. Let's, let's reverse it. This is a plug, and this plug has a, a, a wooden stick. It looks very much like a, a, a match, a wooden match, and it extends up to about there. This runs down and it's connected in here. This is filled with powder. And at the end of it is a round dot of uh, percussion compound. So the idea is when it hits, it explodes. OK, but you still got to ram that thing. <laughs> Not a good idea. And then uh, there were some other modifications to Yankee bullets. These were known now as Williams cleaners, but they were designed to be cleaners. They were designed to take the rifling. This is a zinc washer, and the idea is when it's fired, it's, it's shaped like a cup. It flattens out on discharge and goes into the rifling and then takes the rifling. Um, same here and here. We'll see how that shakes out as we go <coughs> through these different types. This one is controversial. Uh, it, it went into production middle of July. There are some say that they came to Gettysburg, but I, I don't think so. Some were found in Gettysburg, but they came after the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, this is basically how it works. This is profile. It's all one cast. Instead of cutting the sprue off, they left the sprue on, put two zinc washers, got one over here, and when it's fired, flattens out. They found out that it, it, it's good for taking rifling, but it's a lot better than for cleaning out the barrel. It'll scrape that barrel clean. So one out of every 10-ish or so, we're supposed to be a Williams cleaner. It keeps that gun clean. But the problem is, and this is how it looks, and how it's peened over, and these are the washers. The problem is, is that all that gunk that is out the barrel and going toward you is going to hit you with toxic lead and all the debris that happens to be in that barrel. Paper, other burnt things that are in there. Uh, it'll make a horrific wound. For many years, Confederates believed that that was a poison bullet because of the illness and the sicknesses and the horrific wounds that were coming from this. And again, just the same idea, the different pattern of the Williams finger bullet. And then we go to carbines. This is great, man. I mean, war can be very, very profitable. Uh, Mr. Colonel Ambrose Burnside of the 1st Rhode Island Infantry, later Corps Commander, then Commander and, and Commanding General of the Army of the Potomac at the Battle of Fredericksburg, had in 1857 
um, patented and produced the carbine and cartridge with his name. Nice military and economical move. Note where the ammunition is manufactured. Burnside Rifle Company. Soldier had to have the, or the cavalryman had to have the right cartridge to fit that gun. If he has a Spencer, not going to work. If, if he has a, a Sharps, it's not going to work. All these different carbines. Uh, here's a Merrill carbine. Again, same thing. Um, had to match, and that's how we know about what these are. I, I like to emphasize that. We know that came out of this pack, so we know where it came from, when it was made, and what it was for. Here's the rubber cartridge. I have one, two, actually. That's a rough India rubber cartridge. It's meant to be reloaded for the Smith's carbine. Now you have the Smith carbine. You have the Gallagher carbine. You have the Maynard carbines. All these carbines, and none of them interchanged, with exception of the Spencer and, well, we'll get to that. Here we go. <laughs> the Spencer and the Jocelyn. The Spencer, question. The Spencer was used at Gettysburg, but it was used before Gettysburg in the Gettysburg campaign. Where was it used first? Hanover. Remember, Custer was the guy that had the, had the rifles, the carbine. There were no carbines. There were no Spencer carbines at Gettysburg. They were all rifles. And the Michigan Brigade under Custer was the one that had the rifles. The carbines did show up out in Tennessee in Hoover's Gap. No, that's where they were, were first used. 58 million of these cartridges were produced. And these are the cartridges for the Sharps. I have a whole case full of Sharps cartridges down there. Nitrated paper, and that's linen, as you can see. 52 caliber. Uh, the sharpshooters, you know what I need to, I need to say something about that, real quick. Quick, quick, notes, 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 notes. All right. Uh, 93 million of those cartridges, both, both types, uh, were produced. Berdan sharpshooters at Gettysburg used these 52 caliber sharp carbines and ammunition. The Colt, uh, the, the Colt revolving rifle, 56 caliber, the um, uh, Berdan sharpshooters used those first, turned them in, then got sharps rifles and were using them. Building Hearst Red Blood, it was not used at Gettysburg, it's 25 barrels. 25 barrels of 52 caliber, and it basically you could defend bridges. And you pull the lanyard and whoop, they all go off. You really don't want the ammunition that way. Uh, whether you hit something or not, I don't know, but it makes a lot of smoke and noise. There's the lender. Remember that set I bought for two bucks each? That's the lender. I know what a lender looks like. That's a $35 boot for two bucks, I'll take it all day long. And then, uh, then we'll move on to something a little larger. Is the 69 caliber top ones are machine made in the north, machine made in the north, 69 caliber. And then these are Confederate ones from down in the south, all cast. Now you see this place says Austrian. It's not an Austrian bullet. It, it gets that name by it's guilty by association. In the camps where some of these bullets are found, they find Austrian gun parts. And so they make the assumption that the Austrian gun part must have been fed by an Austrian bullet. No, not necessarily, but it has stuck. Confederate bullets, these two were made in France, or three were made in France. That big, ugly, ugly thing down there was Confederate manufactured thing, and it's uh, very rare. Confederate bullets, again, here's the Carcano. It was made the deaf, dumb, and blind in North Carolina, Richmond. And this one is from the Louisiana troops. Remember the night of July 2nd at Gettysburg and East Cemetery Hill when the Louisiana Tigers are attacking East Cemetery Hill and Ricketts Battery is up there, along with some other batteries. Ricketts Battery is up there almost alone until infantry come <coughs> behind them. The Louisiana Tigers, many of them, not all, many of them were shooting these at those guys. Uh, 69 caliber Gardner again. There's an Austrian, look at that thing. That thing's ugly before it hits, like terrible. And these, these so-called shotgun slugs, also in North Carolina, deaf, dumb, and blind. I don't know how that looks. I don't know, no, the deaf, I can see what they can do. I don't know what the blind were doing. I don't, don't know. Buck, buck and ball and buck shot. The buck shot, great killers in the battlefield, moving them along. Whitworth bullets. Uh, these are the cylindrical types. Quick comment on that. 
Confederate fortified caliber cylinder of a Whitworth sharpshooter bullets from England. Union General John Sedgwick was killed by one of these type of bullets at the Battle of Spotsylvania just after he uttered, why, what are you ducking for? They couldn't hit an elephant at that distance. Moments later, one of these bullets hit Uncle John beneath the left eye, killing him instantly. Uh, these are what the cartridges look like. These two on the end here are, again, it's out of proportion because my presentation is different on different computers. But these were known as bullets on a stick. I think it got that name right. Then there was another type of Whitworth, and this is the hexagonal. There has been quite a debate whether the hexagonal, it's a six-sided bullet. I've got a whole case of them right there. It's a six-sided bullet. It's like you take six sides and you pull it and you twist it. That's what it looks like. And the barrel inside is shaped the same way. And these things were incredibly accurate. They're going to reach a long way. They'll, hit a, uh, they'll travel a mile, more than a mile, pretty accurately. So they come in this, in this uh, configuration. It's been an argument whether these are actually used here. Well, enter the relic hunter. A relic hunter was in the Confederate camp and found a site where several of the cylindricals, many of these cylindrical bullets, cylindrical meaning straight, smooth, were found. And inside of that, there's a picture of a, a hexagonal laying there. Yes, they did use them. Not extensively. Now, these are just pistol bullets. A whole world of pistol bullets. Not even going to waste time going through that. Now, I pose it. I bring it to a i bring it to a conclusion. This is a picture looking northwest from the National Cemetery. This is the Dobbin House right there. That's South Washington. I'll use it, but I won't turn the page. Uh, South Washington Street's coming down here. Dobbin House is here. Emmitsburg Road is here. No, that's not. Yeah, it is. That's Emmitsburg Road. This coming down through here should be the Tawny Town Road. Um, that's the end of the field. This is all built up now. The, the hospital is right in around this area now. I want to draw your attention to this little house. Has anybody here been down South Washington Street and noticed this house? You've got to do it this weekend before crowds start coming in. That house still stands. That house is here on South Washington Street. And look at the bullet. It was the last house. Confederates were in this house shooting at the Union Line, about where the angle is in where the cemetery is now. And a couple of Yankee shells went through there, dispatching a couple of Confederates at the same time in that house. That house shit gray, though. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I like to see that in a different color. And you can see these bullets all over. It is said that there's 800 to 850 bullet holes. Yes. What's the address? I don't have an address, but you don't need an address. You get on, if, if you go to, if you go down Emmitsburg Road, or I should say Steinberg, you go down Steinberg to the first light, uh, where you see the cemetery on the left, you have to then make a real sharp turn and start heading back up. You start heading back up South Washington Street. On the left, you will see the hospital. You pass the hospital and this big gray house on your left. You can't miss that. What street is that? Uh, South Washington. And if you, I suggest park your car and go for a walk. Go for a walk and up South Washington. Oh, that's the front of the building. And you can see more bullet holes all over. Oh, there you go. 407. Wow, look at that. <laughs> if you walk up the street, just before you get to South Street, that South Street crossing with the stop sign there, you come to this house, and when you walk by, you see, is this a period house? If this is a period house, there's probably some damage. And sure enough, looking closer, and you look up, you can see bullet hole there, bullet hole there, bullet hole there, bullet hole there, and there are several up and around this building. And if you keep on going, uh, I forget the name, I think that's Middle Street, the next one, there's a big white house, there's an artillery shell stuck in it. You're familiar with this one, of course. Yes. Who's been to the Fonsworth house? Yeah, kind of cool. I liked it. Uh, I don't know how many of those are real. I'm sure many of them are, but I don't think all of them are. It sure is a good PR tool, but it, it still is a, a lot of battle damage on there. Right across the street, now this is going to be a small little, little advertisement here. This is Mr. G's. This is a neat house. I like this guy. He has like soft ice cream. You get it hot in the summertime, want some ice cream, go there. 
love it. The atmosphere is wonderful. You can see on the side there are bullet marks all over. There are bullet holes through here, through there, through there. And the owner, uh, a year ago, I was there, and uh, we just got to talking two years ago. And uh, he said, hey, you want to see the second floor? <laughs> yeah. So we went upstairs, and he says, this is where my office is. And you go back. Uh, his office is right, right here. And up in that window, there is a bullet hole through the frame, and he's checked in the back wall, and apparently the owners many years before had since removed it. And uh, he said, you want to go up to the attic? I said, yeah, that's so cool. So we went up in the attic, and you realize this, this building is, it was known as twin sycamores. The one sycamore, huge sycamore tree stood here. It apparently had a uh, disease and they had to bring it down. But the other one, um, can I see that one? No, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, the other one you can see right over here. It still stands. It is a testament. It is a living witness to Lincoln going by to the Gettysburg Address. And it is a witness to the battle here. I'll mention something about that tree when it was brought down. So he's taking me upstairs. He said, we had to put some uh, new duct work in because of uh, we've got a store here now and we've got to have up to code. So he gets it up to code and they had to pull up the floor and he found this piece of cloth. It was linen. Yes, it was linen. And there was blood stains on it. He said, now I don't know if this is from the battle or if the guy who before owned this and hammered down the floor, bam, hit his thumb and kind of just put that on there and threw it away. We don't know. Uh, he said he was going to check to find out what he can if it's even human blood. But beyond that, but it's really neat. It's really neat place to sit there and just look at the history. All right. There is this tree that he cut down because it was rotting out, and in it was a Union mini ball. Now, I know there were many more in there, but that was one they found when they were trying to cut this huge tree up. When you go into the front parlor, he has a table that's made out of a section. It's about that thick and that big around. It's a whole tabletop. All right, we move on. Jenny Wade's house. Lots of bullet marks on it. This is the north side, and apparently that one is the fatal bullet. And not showing up so well here, but you can see a lot of bullet marks on that side. That's the real Jenny Wade house, by the way. Virginia Wade did not live in that previous house. This is where she lived, although she wasn't born there. Anybody recognize that building? That's the Sherfree building, across from the Peach Orchard. Now, there are, and there are only three more pictures, then we're done here. This is um, uh, a place where one of the park rangers lived. You can walk around their house. You can walk around their house and look at their house. They encourage you to do that. But you can't go up to the window and look in. Don't do that. You might be able to do that at Meade's headquarters or the Ryan House up above where there's uh, at, uh, at the angle. You can maybe do it up there. But this is the house that we're living in. But you walk around it, and you can see the holes, bullet the holes all around it. The, the carnage that took place around there is incredible, undescribable. But one thing you will notice, if you can't see it here, is that there are no bullet marks from here over. Nothing up here. Why? Yeah, they added on. Yeah, it was a house that people were living in for a long time. So they added on, but you can still see the <coughs> marks. And uh, there's just another one, and that would be my last photograph. Yes, you can still see. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir, and then we'll go back. Uh, you originally stated that the average Civil War show, soldier could shoot three rounds a minute. I have right, been totally charged shooting uh, the Civil War muskets for 30 years under ideal conditions of a five minute event with one bullet loaded. I get off 13 if I'm lucky. 13? 13, yes. Well, wow. I'm in barrel, ideal conditions. My stuff's right there. But how did they work with the three a minute? Well, that was, that was what the order was. I think for two reasons. You shoot 13 rounds and your box is empty soon. Oh, yeah. it was, it was, they were so worried about the consumption of ammunition. That's why the Spencer, the rim fire, totally waterproofed, rugged, Modern-looking rimfire, the government hated them. They were wonderful. The guy in the ground, the troop in the, in, in the hole, could shoot laying down. He, he could let it get wet. Uh, he, uh, all he had to do is do this, and the shell comes out, and he puts another one in, and he shoots. And he could get a lot of rounds off, maybe as many as you did. Government hated it because every shot you made, we have to replace. <laughs> and so they were really slow in getting 
rapid fire ammunition out there, so they didn't, didn't want them to shoot fast. Where were the lead mines? The who? Lead mines. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I would not want to work in a lead mine. But I don't know. I can't answer that. That's a research project. You just got yourself a homework project. Thank you. <laughs> all right, that's all the questions. All I have. What else? Any questions? Do walk by. And may I say, on your departure, uh, there are some books. If you want to learn about small arms, you, these books are available at good stores up in Gettysburg. This is one by Dean Thomas and his brother uh, Jim. I carry this around when I go to a show, and I mark them, the ones that I have with a little red dot. That way I know I'm going to buy another one. So, any other questions? Let you out of here. Thank you. Uh, thank you.